So I came across Tom's work years ago when he wrote a book called Traffic, which is the subtitle, which is why we drive the way we do and what it says about us. I was very interested in that. And he's gone on to write a number of other fantastic books before, well, before that and since. And the reason I wanted to speak with him today for this week of the Funtervention is that his new book or newest book is called Beginners, The Art and Transform, I'm sorry, The Joy and Transformative Power of Lifelong Learning, which you all should get because it's a fantastic book. And I read this book, which came out last year while I was in the process of writing The Power of Fun and loved it so much that I actually quote Tom in the book. So it's a treat to get to speak to someone whose words I have quoted. And what I love about it is, I mean, just what it's about. It's about getting over our adult inhibitions and trying new things. So I'm thrilled to get the chance to talk to Tom today for our theme of the week, which is pursuing passions. Um, and I wanted to get started by asking Tom if you would be interested in sharing a delight of your own. Uh, yeah, sure. And, and thank you, Catherine, for the <laughs> great welcome and, and a pleasure to be here. Absolutely. Um, yeah, I mean, this morning, it's, it's Monday, it's sleeting rain outside, it's gray, it's cold. I'm in the state of New Jersey. And I was, it, it, it was not a good morning. But then I was taking my daughter to school. And there's this radio station I like called WFMU. And there's a morning show, but the host is named Clay Pigeon, which is kind of a funny thing. But um, Clay has basically helped get me through the pandemic. He's just such a quirky guy. And his a lot of people love his morning show. Anyway, so just listening to him this morning, and he was doing some you know, funny things, playing some interesting music. And it just it just gave me that little um, spark, as it does on, on many days to uh, you know, so, but yeah, I just highly recommend something, something like that, you know, the, like Spotify, the age of Spotify, it's so easy to have any music we want at any time, but just the, the, the someone who's really passionate about putting music together and, and is a personality unto themselves. It's just kind of great to connect in that old school um, way via the radio. So <laughs> I love that. Also, one of the songs that I learned in my guitar class was called Clay Pigeons by Blaze oh. Foley. So I guess it could be, I guess they all could just be talking about clay pigeons, but, um, but that's yeah. a coincidence. <laughs> I think my delight this morning, I mean, I keep mentioning that my mother-in-law makes is a potter and I keep getting to drink tea at a various delightful mugs, but also we adopted a dog as some people on the call might know a couple of weeks ago, and she's very snuggly. And so this morning, as I was typing up some of my notes from, from uh, Tom's book, she jumped on my lap and I was like leaning over this dog while typing and just having another living creature to cuddle with was just very delightful. Um, <laughs> No offense yeah, to I can husband, totally but, uh, yeah. connect with that. We have a rescue uh, cat. I won't go into too much detail, but you know, I, he came from pretty you know bad circumstances. So I think he is just so happy to be where he is now that he just for he's about the most dog like cat I've ever experienced because he's just I think he's just so thrilled to be in a, a warm house with love and all that good stuff. But anyway, it's very it's fun. Yeah, I think of her as like a cat like dog. We have much to discuss, but let me, before I get totally tangented, which is now is a verb, um, can you <laughs> tell us about Beginners? Like what inspired this book? What did you do for it? And then I have a lot of questions for you about it, but. Yeah, I mean, I was first doing this weird thing, you know, I was trying to learn um, chess at, at the same time my daughter was, and I was writing an article about this and I, I thought it was like an interesting kind of social science experiment. How does, how does like a four or five-year-old learn something new compared to a four, late 40 something person. And so at first it was kind of just, okay, let's do this little experiment and learn about learning. And, you know, kind of came across some of the things you hear about, you know, young people having such lightning fast brains and, and all that good stuff. And my daughter, yeah, to answer one question, she is better than me at chess to this day. But, um, <laughs> but you know, the whole, that like weird little experiment just, led me to the conclusion that, and the finding and the realization that I couldn't remember the last, you know, kind of substantive skill that I had sort of taken on as, as an adult and taken a crack at. I mean, I, I'd been doing things like, I don't know, playing soccer recreationally, but I had, I'd been doing those a long time. And, um, and then a second part of that is, you know, I, I was always telling my daughter, oh, it's so important to just to always learn stuff. It doesn't matter if you're going to be very you know, good at it. You just try as many things as possible. You'll, you'll, you'll find the thing that you really connect with. And you know, as I was constantly telling her this, I was looking at myself and like, well, you're not, you're not modeling this uh, behavior very well. And, and you, you know, this often happens, I think, with parents. They become just the, the picture of expert, already existing expertise. 
and you, kids don't often get to see their parents struggle to learn something new and 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 to see that they do struggle and that it just doesn't come easily all the time and I, which i think is a, a great lesson you know to impart to children and for children to see so that wasn't really my initial uh goal but it, it did kind of bring a happy result i think of, of trying to learn all these things so i just sort of said like okay look i've been in this kind of kind of stasis for a couple of decades here, just doing the same old stuff. And I've been, I think, afraid, like many people might be, to, to take a plunge in some of these things. So I just opened that door and came up with a list of things I'd sort of always wanted to do. And about you know your book, Catherine, what, what, what's such a great connection here, I think, is that I, I kind of decided right away that I wanted to do things that actually would be fun or what, what I anticipated would be fun, that this wasn't necessarily a work-related exercise in terms of the skills I was going to learn. Not that there's anything at all wrong with that, but if I set myself five things like, I don't know, I'm trying to, you know, learning uh, how to design my own website, how to uh, <laughs> do calculus, something I was terrible, at, you know, I'm terrible at math. So those are all very admirable goals, but I didn't get the sense that they would bring a lot of pleasure. It would be a whole lot of work. So the things I picked were things that did take a whole lot of work, but even the working at them was sort of fun or, or was very fun actually. So uh, that's, you know, and there's nothing wrong obviously with, with skills that are going to make, make you better at your job and things like that. But uh, th that, that was just fun was sort of like lurking in my, my whole modus operandi. <laughs> well, I love, I love how you put it. He puts in a, <laughs> that you chose five skills, which were difficult to master, but you also chose them for their lack of marketability, which I love. And to clarify to everybody, what Tom ended up choosing was learning chess, singing, surfing, drawing, and juggling with the added bonus of learning how to make jewelry because he lost his wedding ring while he was surfing. So a really wide range. Is that the one? Can we see? Let's see. Yeah, well, I mean, it has um, all the good stuff is on the inside, which won't really show up very ah, well on the good. camera. But yeah, there's some interesting like chess sculpture motifs on the inside. The, the outside is, you know, I, I did grind and polish and shape that, but it kind of just looks like, um, you know, a lot of other rings. And, and, and as my friend, the designer pointed out, you know, the minute I walked out of his studio with this lovely um, polished ring, it was going to get like dinged on the subway pole. And it was it was going to start looking like terrible right away. But the inside is really good. So. If you read his book, there's a whole description. But I love this idea that you chose things that were like not marketable. And you also talk a lot. So, so Tom's a journalist and, and as a journalist myself, like our whole job is to learn about stuff. So in some ways, you'd think we would always be learning something new. But I thought you made a really interesting point in your book about the difference between declarative knowledge and procedural knowledge and how you had been, and most of us adults are doing way more of the former, but not the latter. And I was hoping you can explain a bit about the difference between those two things. Yeah, sure. I mean, you know, declarative knowledge is sort of like knowing about something, you know, knowing, you know, let's say if you were going to try to learn to surf, declarative knowledge would be buying a book that is, you know, how to surf which is very difficult because humans, that, that's not really the way we're most set up to learn a skill. It's a great way to learn information, but a skill you really need to learn you know, with your, your body. You can, you can sort of read alongside, but at some point you're going to have to get your body on a surfboard. So procedural knowledge is this other thing that is you know, knowing, just knowing how to do it internally. And it, it's very hard to articulate that. You just sort of know, and this is why you know, sometimes the point is made that a, pro a professional athlete is actually a very, at the top of their game, is a very bad teacher because they've, that their their knowledge is so deeply procedural. It's so, you know, in their own body that they, they would have a hard time explaining to you how they do uh, what they do. And so declarative and procedural are two different things, two different parts of the brain. And it was even, there's even this famous case of this uh, famous amnesiac patient, HM, was this, was uh, the nickname they, they called him. And they were teaching him this uh, new skill and he he forgot each day that he had been taught it the day before, but each morning he could actually do it. So like his body was you know doing it, but his brain had forgotten that he was learning it. So it just kind of shows you how, how different those um, two things are. Well, and my book too. was oh, go ahead. very procedural. Well, you know, and, yeah. Anyway, like sorry. doing it rather than just, because I was gonna say, it reminds me of my own, I'm definitely guilty of much more declarative knowledge and knowledge acquisition than procedural in many cases. I think in part because it feels safer. Like for example, 
I really want to become better at improvising on the piano. But, and, I, and I've taken piano since I was a kid, but I've always been really shy about the vulnerability that comes with just making stuff up that might sound bad. So what I do instead, pro tip, if anyone wants to not be vulnerable and therefore never actually get good at the thing they're trying to do, is that I don't do that. I just intellectualize everything. So I know a lot about chord theory. I can tell you all sorts <laughs> of facts about the circle of fifths. And I'm really, even to this day, because I still do Zoom lessons with my teacher, my childhood teacher, and I'm really good at getting him to talk about the music. And then I don't have to improvise in front of him because it's scary. So I love the fact that one of the things that you, I mean, what you're doing in your book is to do this stuff, to throw yourself in there. And I thought it'd be fun to talk about, about one of those experiences in particular, because it's something that I've done as well that made me, makes me present times feel very vulnerable, which is that you learn to sing. And I'm wondering if you can tell us a bit about why you decided to do that and what that process was like. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think like, like many people, I'd probably been singing casually my, my whole life, you know, in the car, at moments when I was alone, preferably, right, and in the shower. And it just, you know, there's just, there's such a, a pleasure to singing. This has been, of course, scientifically demonstrated, but I, I don't think we need science to, to understand that, that it can just, you know, you can literally sort of sing your, your blues away. You, you, you even sing a, a sad song, it can make you sort of feel better, weirdly. And there's just a, a lot of research about, you um, you know, singing the, the, the vagus nerve, V-A-G-U-S, part of this parasympathetic highway, they call it, is just, you know, strongly connected to your, to your vocal mechanism, runs all the way down your spine, and is associated with things like anti-depressive uh, uh, feelings, you know, so there's, so it's, there's very strong grounding here. And singing um, can actually affect our moods. Yes, um, you know, it's not, you know, if someone's deeply depressed, I'm not saying it's, you know, going to magically rest you, rest you out of that, but it's just, I've never felt worse after singing. I think a lot of other people would, I mean, I'm, I'm doing this, I mentioned in the book, but I, I do a lot of this, um, this app called Smule, S-M-U-L-E, and it's an online karaoke app. And so many people's bios, you, you go on and you sing duets with people. And so many people's bios, I, I note with interest, you know, say, I'm just here to, to sing and feel better. And like, or, you know, kind of talking about how, how mag, you know, magical singing is and how good it makes them feel. So, um, but, you know, one problem I had and a lot of other people had is that I felt that I just wasn't uh, particularly good at it. And, um, you know, that I just wasn't hitting notes. And, you know, I, I think it could st you could still feel good singing, you know, poorly. But I think you can also gain that additional pleasure by gaining a, at least a little bit of mastery over it and having the sense that you know what you're doing. And, and I don't think this actually takes all that long. I think a few, you know, a little bit of attention and kind of deliberate practice. And you can, if you, the, the thing you hear so often is I'm tone deaf. My, my mother-in-law tells me this, like, I'm, I, I can't sing I'm tone deaf. There's a, a condition called cognitive amusia that is real, but it, it affects such a tiny percent of the actual population where they, they really have trouble distinguishing notes. Most people can sing perfectly. They just are out of practice or don't do it. And like often the reason point, we're right? out if of we practice do it. Like, why would you think you're good at it if we don't do it at all? Like you say, like, right, you say yeah. look, like I can't sing. And it's like, well, when was the last time you tried to sing? Have you ever tried to learn to sing? I mean, as you point out, like it's muscles in your throat that have to contract. Like no one's naturally good at skiing the absolute, but like you're not gonna be a master at the beginning. Sorry to interrupt, but I thought it was really interesting. But no, but it's, it's true though. Cause we, we do, sometimes you hear things like, oh, he has a God given gift with singing. And, you know, there may be something about the quality of their voice that does come from the way they were born, but they still had to work at that. You, you know, you didn't hear, I, I don't know, a professional golfer. Oh, he, he was just born to golf, like at age two. I mean, maybe, maybe Tiger Woods or something, but you know, they, they needed a lot of practice and a lot of work. They, they weren't just magically able to swing this, this golf club. Um, but we, we, yeah, we tend to forget that singing is a motor skill that muscles practice, you know, People often joke, "Oh, can can you sing for me?" You know, right now. I mean, for, I don't think we want that, but like, I, I I take this pretty seriously, and I usually would like to do a warm up, you know, so I don't damage my voice or so I sound better because you know it it works. Anyone who's in a choir probably has gone through this. You do some vocal warm ups. You you shake your body. You know, you get your body ready. It's not you. Know, yeah, any of us could just burst into song right now, but um, and I'm just trying to avoid actually doing that. So. Uh, <laughs> But to um, the song right now, are you worried I'm going to ask you to do that? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. I was, no, just, I do have something not... I was going to ask you to do, but I, but it's not, don't worry. It's not. 
Okay. <laughs> Don't tempt me. I mean, no, only because I can imagine if someone did that to me. I did have someone once at an interview go like, oh, you're learning guitar. Well, can you just play us a song? And I'm like, oh my God, no. I, and I ended up having to do it. And I felt so dumb, which is, you know, I did it anyway, which I think is part of your message too, is like, maybe get over feeling dumb and just do stuff. But don't worry, I will not ask you to sing Chet Baker, though I am intrigued. <laughs> yeah, but I, I do think, you know, there, we're in this weird state in America where singing has been, singing in public has been declining. And part of the reason it's declining is people think they're not good enough. And that's part of this kind of vicious cycle where we're not good enough because we don't do it. And then we don't do it because we're not good enough. And, and you know, I make the case in the book that, you know, a lot of us, the only time we sing is happy birthday a few times a year. And that's actually a very difficult song to sing, as is the national anthem, something we might also sing at a baseball game or something. But um, so, yeah, I don't know how those songs became so common whether they have these like big chord jumps and everything. But um, but I think, you know, all of us, all of us can sing, you know, it can bring anyone pleasure. I, no one told me before working on this book that they thought I was a good singer, that I had the potential to be a good singer. It was, I was not encouraged in any way yet. I have, uh, you know, taken away from this project, this, this new uh, gift in, in, in my life that at least brings me pleasure and, and people that I sing with and, and things like that. So. Well, I thought one of the things that you said in your description of your singing lessons, so to clarify, so Tom took singing lessons independently, which is something I have done I'm as well. Sorry, so I just, totally. Uh... Can you still hear me? Lost my... Um... I... If, you can, if you can hear us, Tom, we can still hear you. Um, sorry, I lost... Uh... Right. Can you hear me, Catherine? Yes, I can hear you. Can uh, hear why me? can't I hear you, though? I've lost my audio for some... You can log off for a second reason. and come back um... if you want. Oh. Okay. Oh, I'm saying it like he can still hear me. Did you know? I can that? hear you now. I'm sorry. I lost okay. something okay. was wrong with my. We're going to go just for the, the just do computer. That. No, that's pretty funny. So, it's right. really like, I can't hear you. And I'm like, I'll keep talking to you as if you can hear me and give you helpful tips and suggestions. No, I was going to say so. I, I, um, so Tom ended up taking private singing lessons um, and then joined a choir, which is very similar to an experience I had where before the pandemic, I decided I wanted to try to take vocal lessons. And it was terrifying, honestly, I thought. I, like, I don't get embarrassed that easily, but I thought that something that Tom, you wrote in your book really captured my experience as well with singing in particular, where you talk about how you're, um, you're being vulnerable at the same time that you're showing your incompetence, <laughs> which I thought was so true for singing where you're expressing yourself through your voice, which is not something, I mean, I guess we do it speaking all the time, but there was something particularly, is something particularly uncomfortable to me about being vulnerable in that way with my voice. But I was wondering if you could tell us a bit about why you think that's important to embrace or how you did learn to embrace that and get over that hump. Because I think that whether it's singing or any other new thing we want to try, there's so often this element of fear and vulnerability. So how, any thoughts on that? Yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there and singing does, I guess, because it's really something we are producing by ourselves. I mean, there's no ex, no other equipment. There's, it's just, it's just you. You're, you're putting yourself out on the line versus, you know, surfing. If I show up as a 48 year old at the beach and I'm, no one's expecting me to be amazing. And, and I mean, and I think that is part of the, that was part of the key to this whole thing was, you know, just realizing, and, and this is kind of the wonder, the, the great thing about taking classes with other beginners, you know, they're, you're usually, you're on some sort of spectrum of like, some people get it sooner, some people takes longer, but you're on that spectrum that's other people also struggling. And you know, the, I forget what it's called in psychology, some the spotlight effect, where we often think more people are paying attention to to us than actually are. So, in my drawing class or something, I was I was struggling. No one else was. They were all struggling. They were they were focusing on what they were doing. No one was really looking at me. So I just, you, yeah, you just kind of had to have that keep that in mind that you know, the only one who really knows what they're doing is the teacher, and they probably struggle also with, with on certain days. Um, so it was easier with certain pursuits to just go in and chess. If I make a chess blunder, I, that doesn't, I don't know, I, I guess I can think, well, you makes me feel bad intellectually. Like, okay, I should have known that. But singing, you know, yeah, it gets to, to the core of, of, of who you are. Yeah. I mean, it's not like, and, and the voice is such a weird thing to begin with, as you sort of hinted at, you know, there's a very famous 
uh, phenomenon in, in the world that we none of us likes the sound of our own voice when when we hear it because partially because the way we hear it through our own heads is different than when we hear it on like a tape recorder for example and um everyone's always like oh god is that is that me god i i hate that but um you know <laughs> i think the way to get better you know just just again just doing a lot of it and practicing and getting just getting comfortable with the sound of your your own voice and and not getting too hung up on not not even just perfection but just I, I mentioned in the book, I, I wanted to start singing songs right away, but my teacher really wanted me to concentrate more on just notes and, and making these almost childlike sounds that were approximations of words. Because, and I, I was sort of like, why? And I said, well, words, you know, we, then we start to mentally conceptualize how they should sound. And they're, it's a whole different sort of language and singing words is different from speaking words. And it's a lot to take on. And to really get comfortable with singing, it was better just to and I, I kind of compare it to the way we learn language as children. You know, we we babble. We don't. Children don't walk around armed with these um, grammar rules and and you know sort of say like, you know, they just babble. They make mistakes. They they say nonsense words. Um, mm -hmm. And that that is kind of a key difference I think between how we learn things as very young children versus adults. So adults don't often have that freedom to to babble like to to in, in whatever the discipline is. Um, you can noodle, you can call it, you know, whatever you noodle on the guitar, call it whatever. Uh, and we, we often come in with these pre existing conceptions of how, of what our progress should be, that we want to be, you know, do XYZ by the third month when, you know, children inhabit a much lower stress, free range, you know, kind of environment that they can just be children and, and learn at their own pace and so that that was really kind of something I tried to keep in the back of my mind and I use the phrase beginner's mind from from Zen Buddhism but just just trying to have that childlike um, quality to your learning practice and not put too much pressure because you're already under so much internal pressure that the last thing you need is you know sort of this external pressure from from goals and, and things like that so that was uh, not to say that I've conquered any of these things and um, <laughs> My, I'd still probably feel a little bit nervous speaking, uh, singing before my voice teacher. And no, that, that's probably, I think we're probably, probably comfortable enough, but I would still be embarrassed if I went to the beach and, you know, wiped out on a surfboard. It just, you know, it just, it never goes away. So, you, so if it never goes away, then why is it worth doing? What are we missing out on by being so scared of that dumb feeling? Because in your book, you write explicitly that there's quote magic in these early stages. But what you just described doesn't necessarily sound like the magic part. So can you tell us a bit more about that? Like, what are we missing out on? I just feel like, you know, there's there's this great, you know, there's this thing, the learning curve. People always use this in a very negative way. Like it has, oh, that has a very, a very steep learning curve. And I, I make this kind of specific point that a learning curve is actually time versus progress. And most things we would take a crack at like like singing or, or drawing actually have a pretty steep learning curve people think oh that's that's scary but no that's actually that's actually great you make a lot of progress in a very short time more than you might imagine and I did this um, one week drawing class with um, the the son of uh, the woman who wrote uh, the very famous book drawing on the right side of the brain and it was a one week class and you begin the, the week by drawing a self-portrait which was, you know, also terrifying. And <laughs> mine looked like the worst, you know, sort of criminal mugshot that you can imagine. It, it, my, you know, the geometry of my face was horrifically wrong. Uh, after a week of attending this class, you know, we, we were all turning out, like every student was turning out competent self-portraiture. Um, and, you know, so that's, one week is a pretty short turnaround time for it's so really because like I am still I mean it's just, like I don't think I, I when my daughter is six and when she draws she's she's giving me drawing lessons and I'm like you know not actually faking it I'm not like toning down my own abilities to make her look good it's like right. no that's pretty much the last time I tried to draw was probably when I was six so you really like really because I really don't think I'm visual but I'm intrigued but I can't imagine I would get any better so you're telling me I'm wrong no I mean you know and and you, He's like, you no, know, the you right, can still suck. You can the right suck. teacher is, is, you know, so, sometimes it take, does take the right teacher or the right method of instruction. It's not, you know, that there are, there are ways, I guess you could be more productive in, in that way. But um, I mean, the key, my key takeaway, and this often happens with, with drawing students and what he, what this teacher was constantly trying to impress is, you know, it's not, 
he, you have to learn to see, not learn mm-hmm. how to draw. That he he could he had taught you know people with 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 severe disabilities who had trouble with their their hands. He had you know taught them to, to competently draw. So it wasn't this you know, it wasn't this magic in the pencil or or in your your hand. And he he sort of joked because one day I was ha- I was having trouble drawing a, the sheet on a on a bed. And he said, "Oh, let me get let me get my special sheet pencil." And and, I, and I, at first for a minute I was like, "Oh, you have one?" And of course he was he was joking. <laughs> he was just saying, you know, this same pencil should be able to draw a sheet, an ocean, a bird anything. It's just how you're going to look at it, how you're going to interpret it, how you're going to put it down on, on the piece of paper. So, um, so yeah, so I think what, you know, why this is worth doing, I think, you know, nowadays we, there was such a, a hullabaloo around this, this idea of the 10,000 hours of, of practice that was required to make someone an expert in something. And I don't have 10,000 hours left in my life that are, that are spare to, you know, to become a, a chess master, let's say. So, you know, I, but I, it doesn't have to be an all or nothing thing. I, my question was, what could you learn in a hundred hours or, or even 10 hours? And, and the question with 10 hours was, you know, more than I thought. And that, you know, I, I was sort of, that simple 10 hours began to open doors that changed the way I thought about myself, the way I saw the world, the way I appreciated art, let's say, like, you know, just taking a few introductory art classes suddenly changes the way you see art, which, which is sort of a great experience. I could kind of go to a museum and try to appreciate it aesthetically and read the wall text and, oh, that's interesting. And then suddenly, you know, if you know something about the technique involved, you're, you're just approaching it on a whole different level, one that was pretty much closed to me uh, before. So, um, mm-hmm. and that didn't take 10,000 hours of, you know, of work. Well, I love that idea because I think so often when we think about trying something new, it can seem really intimidating because we kind of skip automatically from just the idea, the childlike curiosity about like, I just wonder what it'd be like to draw to thinking you have to be a master or that you have to become some like a, a painter or something. Like I just noticed someone said something in the chat about feeling like anything that seems fun starts to feel like a to do. And I wonder if part of that is this pressure we put on ourselves to not just dabble in it, but then to make it too serious. Like we go very quickly from curiosity to making it serious instead of giving ourselves a little bit more space. And I was wondering if you could, I mean, that reminds me of the, the part in your book when you talk about the word dilettante and what we get wrong about the word dilettante. And uh, I know we've got a couple of questions that I want to get to in a second, but I'm wondering if you can speak, uh, tell us a bit more about that word. And Absolutely. You know, I mean, yeah, dilettante, we have this idea that, oh, it's a person that doesn't stick with one thing that just dabbles in all these little things. And the original word, you know, comes from dilettare, which means delight uh, in Italian. And it was this group of uh, 18th century, you know, sort of English men mostly, but, you know, who, who just went on the grand tour in Europe and went to museums and they did tried some painting and they just, you know, yeah, they had a, they had a certain amount of privilege to begin with, but they were also amateurs. They didn't, they weren't professionals. And they just plunged into these things for the sheer, sheer delight. And um, yeah, and I think, you know, there's such a, a productivity drive in my, my inbox is, I think I get about eight productivity newsletters from various people. And it was, I feel like there needs to be an app to like be productive with your productivity newsletters. Um, totally. <laughs> everything has to be optimized. There's just an article I was reading about how to optimize your television viewing because there's so many series being produced right now that you know so <laughs> right like this maximization I mean geez it's exhausting yeah and when I think maybe the answer is just to, to, to walk away or just you know maybe if, if, if television is no longer fun then why am I participating in it but um uh-huh. yeah so I, I kind of um I'm sorry, I just lost the tra- train of thought of what your actual Oh, we're talking about there. the dilettante idea, but you made me also think about, we're getting a lot of comments in the chat and questions about what if this fun thing starts feeling like a burden? And it actually reminded me um, of a story I thought might be relevant to talk about, which is your experience road biking. I think it's true, like often something we get really into or that we're interested in, it starts to feel onerous after a while. And then that could be really confusing. So I'm wondering if you can share that story and just any insights that you took away from that that might be helpful to people. Sure, yeah. I sort of um, fell into you know road cycling around age 40 based on a story I was doing for a magazine. And, um, and, and I loved it. You know, I hadn't really ridden a bike so seriously, but I just sort of fell in right away. Loved the whole thing, getting out. It, was, it was, made me feel good. It was exercise. I was with people. 
I, I have nothing but good things to say about cycling. However, I, you know, I sort of, part of this, yeah, I, it's like, oh, it's kind of fun to try to go faster. And then maybe I should, I could try racing and that could be a thing. And then, you know, racing, they have these categories, you're cat five, four or three. And, you know, if, if you're one, you're a professional. Um, I, you know, I suddenly became obsessed with, you know, becoming a cat, four, cat four, they call it from cat five. And, and just, but that, that, that road to get there was just to go down each level of, of complexity and difficult just required so much more time, so many more hours on the bikes, so much more work that I really didn't have. And I, I started feeling bad and guilty about, you know, not being able to make training deadlines and, and not hitting these wattage numbers on, on the bike. It was all, and I, you know, I was getting these, I mean, I think the worst moment, lowest moment was when I had a test to test the, the lactate threshold of my body when, when you start feeling the burn, so to speak. But I, I was on a stationary bike pedaling as hard as I could and someone was pricking my finger, taking blood samples and telling me, you know, that I was just like, wow, this, sound well, fun. this, this is fun. a lot of pain. Um, so <laughs> how to tell that you've taken something too far. Someone is actually drawing blood from you while you're doing the fun. Part. Right, right. Yeah, like the never, <laughs> never happened in singing. Um, but right. you know, all respect to people who are, are you know, passionate racers and who keep going down that road. But for me, I just felt like, yes, perhaps there's the realization that you're, you're not going to, you, you've hit a plateau and to push through that plateau is just going to require so much more work that it begins, becomes counterproductive. So I just tried to re reevaluate my relationship with, with cycling and kind of look for other things I could do, other types of rides, kind of forget about racing at least for a while, or, or you know, just maybe focus on different sorts of semi-competitive things and just you know try to bring the the original feeling that drew me into it i did i didn't be, uh get interested in cycling because i wanted to feel pain <laughs> and i wanted more you know charts in my life and work i, I because it felt made me feel really good so i just tr tried to get back to that sense and i think you know um it, it's a it's a tough relationship and this is what happens you know you get good at something and all the avenues sort of point you toward toward other opportunities that require more expertise and talent. You know, pick anything. Singing, well, I, I'm in an amateur choir. Maybe there's a, a better choir that I'd like to join that has tryouts that I then have to practice for. And, and that that's it's all great, but I just that wasn't what this was about per se, or or it wasn't about you know from the beginning. Maybe that could happen as a happy accident or something, but. Um, I just, yeah, I was trying to reclaim both all these words, dilettante, uh, amateur. The word mediocre, this is a fun fact, in Latin means halfway to the top. So you say like, okay, I'm a mediocre singer, but you know, given, given that I was here before, and if this is like, you know, uh, Pavarotti or something, you know, halfway would be, would be pretty amazing. So I, I'll, I would happily be mediocre at most things. I um, used to I, teach a lot and I did not know that. So thank you for that fun fact. And as you point out, the word amateur comes from love, which is just beautiful to me. But I think you bring up a really interesting point that that kind of answers what people are asking that I'm asked a lot too. It's like, how do you prevent these things from turning into a feeling of work? And I think a lot of it, it seems for you, and it definitely is true for me, is repeatedly checking in with yourself to ask yourself if you're still enjoying it. And if you're not, to kind of ask yourself why, like, where did you kind of go down a path that started to make this feel more like work? And the better you get at noticing that feeling in the moment, the easier it will be to self-correct early so that you don't have to give it up completely, but you can kind of redirect. I think that's one of the beautiful things about being an adult with uh, leisure pursuits, right? Is we get to choose what they are by definition. So if it doesn't feel good and it feels onerous and like a to-do and a burden, well, then don't do it. Um, yeah, and what, what oh, you're ahead. saying brings up the point that, you know, maybe there could be red flags that you know, signs that you've taken this thing too seriously. I don't actually know what those are. I haven't thought about this before, but you know, I mean, and again, it's easy. I mean, one, one thing might be like, you're trying to over optimize something for, for the sake of, of time or speed. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, there's just so much written online and internet gurus and stuff like, you know, learn how to do X in X hours or, you know, and I mean, no one wants to spend like more time than they absolutely have to, but I think, you know, that, that is a danger sign that you're just trying to short circuit something. And for me, I, I sort of liked moving slowly and, and learning slowly and, and treating that as the, it sounds like a cliche, but you know, the, it's the journey, not the destination, et cetera. But 
there, there are probably other you know warning signs that we could uh, make a nice list somewhere. Well, I think also the idea when you start to feel your self-critic jump back in, right? I mean, for me, and I think when I'm writing about fun, I realized that one of the the anti-fun factors as I came to think about it was self-criticism or judgment or this feeling of inadequacy, which comes from this little critic we have inside of ourselves. And it's really hard, especially as adults, I think, to let go of our perfectionism and let just basically tell that voice to be quiet and that our moments of true fun happen when we succeed, successfully get that critic to go get distracted by something else. But I think that that's something to kind of keep an eye on is when do you start feeling that inadequacy? When do you start feeling bad about yourself for this thing you're doing that you supposedly love? And also the idea that so often I think that there's like a conveyor belt we can get onto with any new skill. It's like, oh, well, you did that. You mastered this level. Like you, ne- you want to go to the next one. Now you want to be racing on your bike. Now you want to be even better racing. Like as you write in your book, all of a sudden you're optimizing your diet and like spending the rides just talking about what weird foods you guys were eating instead of looking at the scenery, spending more time thinking about the computer on your bike than you what you actually were experiencing. So I think it does take a, a self-awareness and also a bit of work to make sure that you actually want to be in the stage that you're in, that you're not let, just getting sucked along on this conveyor belt of the activity. Um, but I wanted to Absolutely. ask you, just, oh, go ahead. Mm-hmm. Oh, no, I was just wanted to, you know, get across just one point because it's related to what you're saying, which is that, you know, we just, one thing that was unified all of my beginner experiences and continues to this day when I still try new things is, is making mistakes. I mean, I made mistakes in everything I tried and, you know, it was pointed out to me early on by a, a professor that I, that I like that, you know, said, you know, with, without mistakes, there's no learning. Like if, if you do something perfectly, that means you've already learned it. So maybe it's time to move on to the next thing. And, you know, I just, gardening, like, like something that you think you wouldn't make mistakes is I've, I'm pointing out to my yard, I've killed so many plants in my first year of, of gardening. I've, I've like Plant wasted murderer. so much money, but, and, and you could say, well, maybe if you had researched ahead of time and spent a lot of more time you know, optimizing how you were going to garden and read all these websites and watched all these videos and like, yeah, I could have done that, but sometimes it's sort of fun to make the mistakes. And it, that's, you really, you know, they're your mistakes that you're making and you're getting over them your, your own way. And, and that, I think finding your way out of those mistakes is such a valuable part of learning, but just goes back to your point that of self-criticism, that if I stop myself at the sign of the first mistake or or 10 mistakes that I was making I I would wouldn't be doing these things but just finding a way around them became sort of a challenging and and interesting puzzle sometimes and and it's interesting too how that research process can be our way of kind of tricking ourselves into thinking that we're trying it but what we're really doing is is as I was alluding to in the beginning with the piano improv thing we're 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 holding ourselves back a bit because just going in there and not being afraid to make the mistakes that's part of it but it can be so scary um, I just sent out a picture to my newsletter list this morning of a story I tell in the book where I, I was learning how to skull as of when I was turned 40, I signed up for these rowing lessons. And, uh, and I ended up falling into the Schuylkill River in Philadelphia on a very rainy day. And I will maintain that it was my coach's fault for giving me super slippery oars <laughs> in the middle of a rainstorm, but I fell into the Schuylkill. And, uh, but when I came up from the water, I just was laughing because I was like, this is so absurd. I just thought it was really funny. And I was so grateful because there's definitely times in my life where I would have beat myself up for that. And then where I would have just been like, Catherine, you idiot, or, you know, you should be embarrassed. And instead I was telling everybody, I remember I took myself out to lunch that day for some reason. I'm like telling the waiter, I'm like, I fell into this Google today. And (laughs) the guy actually turned out that he rode also. And we had a fun conversation and it was such a learning experience for me to be like, oh, I should embrace that because it makes the experience more fun. It makes the mistakes more fun, you know, just get over yourself. And then you might find a way to connect with people. Um, I know we only have a couple more minutes. I wanted to just finish with um, with two questions for you that I see popping up and that I've heard from a lot of people. One is how do you actually, how do you personally, or how do you recommend that one makes space for trying new things, especially if you're a parent or you're you know, in a relationship and how do you do that? And then if people out there are just really lost as to what to even start with, like how to come up with something new to try. I was wondering if you have any thoughts on that. Yeah, um, I mean, space time is a very big, thing, obviously. I mean, I I do think, and I I noticed you mentioned this in your book as well, that we sometimes convince ourselves that we don't have as much time as we actually do, or, you know, we're just kind of mismanaging time. I always joke about people telling me that I don't have time to learn chess, but then I ask, but then they say, oh, but I really would like to, because I saw The Queen's Gambit on Netflix. And I'm like, okay, you just spent eight hours watching chess when you could have spent eight hours learning chess. So clearly there's some time there too. But, you know, I think 
you know, uh, just one thing that was important for me is just, it's just the great thing about classes. I, I, I'm a person that generally needs structure. I need accountability. I need to be somewhere at, you know, eight o'clock on Monday or because I'm, I'm not going to do it on my own or not going to do it as effectively, just having that person to answer to. And it, it just gives, gives your life structure. Then you know to block that time off. Um, but uh, the pandemic showed though that, you know, learning online is really a, a powerful uh, tool and, you know, not often not like settling, you know, we think, oh, it's on an on, on, online class, excuse me, we're, we're settling. But I think it really it, you know, can be quite powerful. And a lot of things that me and my daughter were, were both doing in person, you know, just shifted online and the learning continued. So that, that's just a way to better accommodate, better accommodate your schedule. And there's, if you can think of something you want to learn, someone is teaching it somewhere, often, you know, at a pretty good um, price and without the commute and all this stuff. So, you know, it's just, it kind of is the golden age of, of learning. And then um, question of as to where to even start, I, I just, ask friends like, hey, you know, what, what cool things have you learned lately? And I try not to <laughs> get- they ever like just... nothing? And then they look really sad at you and well, yeah. <laughs> that, that I think can happen too. <laughs> I mean, yeah, you don't want to be, I mean, there's, but literally there's some, there's, I mean, some people told me things that were like very small things and, and, but, but that's fine. I mean, there's a, a great book I like called Micro Skills. Mm-hmm. And it's like, even, you know, something like learning to chop a tomato in a way that is like great and saves you a lot of time and just looks cool like that you know that's something you probably learn on youtube pick it up in a few days like but that that just you know that starts the cycle and it kind of gets in your mind like oh you know it's fun to just do something new like it reminds you that you're a evolving human with you know that you have these untapped skills so i think micro skills are you know sort of a great place to start and can point you toward exploring some of the larger skills. And I would just say like, once you're into one of these things, don't worry if you're finding it's not really for you. I've, I've certainly walked away from things or stop things. And, you know, you, there's a bit of guilt associated with that, but you, you don't often know in the beginning, you know, you do, I, the thing I say in the book is like, don't announce something is your passion before you know, it's your passion. You know, it, it, it doesn't have to be your passion. It's fine. It might take you off for the passion to develop, but Carol Dweck, the psychologist makes this interesting point that people who think of something as a passion sometimes assume that that that's all they have to do is think of it as a passion. They don't have to then put in the hard work. If you think of something as a passion and then it turns out to be a real slog to learn, you might start to sort of resent that quote unquote passion. Um, So, you know, I I just like, passion is like one of these things like goals that sounds great, but don't let them become the overwhelming, you know, just, 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 just do it. Um, there's a, there's a slogan, uh, you know, <laughs> Oh, you should trademark that. <laughs> yeah. No, but I love that. And I think that that brings up, um, first of all, I love that people are starting to drop some things into the chat that they've been experimenting with. So in our last couple of minutes, I would encourage you, if anybody has just what Tom's saying, something you've learned in the last, I don't know, whenever that you think would be fun for other people to try, whether I saw there was like some suggestions, like taking a online acro yoga class, which seems nuts to me, but go for it. I know a lot of people have been taking online improv classes, as people who've been on my calls before know, not an improviser, that sounds like hell to me, but you guys go for it. I mean, I love improv comedy and it's philosophy, but I am not, not, a, not a fun magnet. But also things like, you know, Tommy made me think my husband and I once took a knife skills class. And to this day, I derive real satisfaction from the way I chop an onion, if I may say so myself. So I think that there's, it's really useful to think about it in a lesson, like you're saying, in little bits. Is we're talking about like singing, right? And like being totally vulnerable and somebody and lying on the floor of a stranger's apartment making blubbering sounds like a baby. You might be like, yeah, I'm not, I'm not gonna do that, um, especially right now. You don't need to do that. We're talking start small. So I think that maybe our message today is start really small. Just find something you are vaguely curious about, teensy bit, and then see if there's a way to experiment with that. Um, and I also love something, Tom, that you point out, um, certainly in an interview I've heard, I think you say it in the book as well, but we have this tendency as adults to think of ourselves as these finished products, right? Our kids, we tell you can become anything. You know, I tell my daughter, Shelly, like, I don't know how to do a cartwheel. And I'm like, dot, 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 yet, you know, the inspirational mom. But we don't do that for ourselves. And I love the point that, Tom, you make that's like, well, why, right? Like, I, I could have said, I'm Catherine and I'm not a drummer. But at some point during the pandemic, I got, or before the pandemic, I got curious about drumming and now I take drum lessons. I don't know if I'd say I am a drummer yet, but I'm, I'm someone who takes drums and like, how cool is that? In other words, we're not fixed till we're dead. And as far as I can tell, no one's dead in here. So, so weird. Um, so I think we can just kind of let ourselves go a bit. 
Um, and before just uh, Tom, if there's anything you want to say to wrap up, I wanted to share, well, first of all, Tom's website, Christy, can you drop that in the chat? It's just tomvanderbilt.com. But if you want to check out his books, I highly recommend them. As I said, I will hold this up again. Um, also, if you want to have a place to start for yourselves, I did create some worksheets. I don't know what to call them. Fun sheet sounds cheesy. Worksheet sounds like work. Sheets exercises, I don't know, whatever. Anyway, it's called the Fun Magnets Finder, which is designed to help you figure out some of the, the, the activities and settings and people that are the most likely to bring you into a state of playful connected flow. So you can play around with that. And then also a fun compatibility quiz, which is basically an attempt to help you hone in on some of the factors and the characteristics of activities that often generate fun for you so that you can use that to generate more ideas for things to try. And also it can be a fun thing to do with other people in your life to see where you do and don't overlap. So check those out. Um, one other thing I was gonna to say, Tom, that I, I love the point that you made in your book in terms of the space and time for fun and for trying new things is that you did a lot with your daughter. And I think that you made the great point that if you're a parent and you're worried about the other parent being resentful of you trying this new thing, try new things with your kid, then they get some free time, hopefully to try some new things. So anyway, before we wrap up, Tom, I just want to see if there's anything else that you wanted to add. Um, and then wanted to thank everybody for making the time for this. Um, yeah, that, that last point is, is a very good one. My wife, for example, wrote a book called How Not to Hate Your Husband After Kids. So clearly, you know- we That was had, your wife? Yeah. So, so, um, so we, you know, we had some issues about you know, delegating childcare responsibility, but you know, that, this is the thing. Suddenly my daughter and I were doing all these uh, classes together and she was almost missing my daughter. We were, we were gone so often learning all these things. So, um, but you know, it doesn't, doesn't take having a kid or anything like that, but um, yeah, just to, you know, I mean, just one, one last, cause since you brought up online improv, I, I, I'm still a little bit, I think there's things that we, we write, we write off ahead of time. Like, Oh, that's not for me. I, I, I wouldn't like that. And I think, you know, this book has sort of changed my thinking about that, that to really just be completely more open-minded about, even if, even if I, something's not going to be like my thing that I've, I mean, just two weeks ago, we, I learned um, pickleball at, at the Y because I they had it you know, like, cause I had heard it, you know, who hasn't yeah, heard of it I'm now? Right. And I, it, yeah. Like, I don't see myself, you know, becoming a pickle pickleball. <laughs> there, there's already, there's already a pro pickleball. pickleballer. Um, is that, the, is that the term? Yeah. A cir okay. Circuit, but <laughs> dot, dot, dot yet. It's, but it's fun. It was a new thing. There was new motions. It's sort of like tennis, not quite like tennis. It, you know, new rules. There were people there that were better than me. They were older than me. They were better than me. It was kind of humbling. And uh, I vowed to come back the next week and, and do better. And um, so, yeah, I just, I, I wouldn't write off anything ahead of time because you just, you just really never know until the, the skill, when you're, when you're doing the skill, it sometimes feels a lot different than what you know about that skill from the outside. So um. I totally agree. I think also just asking yourself what the worst, what's the worst that can happen? Because I can tell you in improv comedy, the worst can happen. Falling in the school call, right? Uh, it's it's the right that, you, <laughs> that you keep saying, you know, you're supposed to say yes and with improv comedy. In my case, I kept saying no. And then they ended up calling scene and just turning off the lights on me. So I could tell you that was extremely embarrassing. It happened like 20 years ago. And I still remember the feeling very vividly, but that's the worst that happened. That's the worst that happened. It was fine. So Thank you so much, Tom. Thank you to everyone who made the time to uh, be with us here today. I really look forward to reading through the chat afterwards. Um, play around with the fun magnets, the fun compatibility quiz. Those are in the chat as well. I also emailed out a link and that there's links on the uh, screenlifebalance.com slash fun intervention if you want to check that out. Um, keep in touch and play around and I can't wait to hear how it goes and hope to see you at the next call, which will be with Lori Santos, host of the Happiness Lab podcast. We're going to talk about how to attract fun coincidentally on Valentine's Day. That's actually gonna be at 5 p.m. Eastern uh, because of Lori's schedule. So I will send out information about that. I hope you can join it. Check out Tom's book and um, thank you again. Thanks so much, Catherine. Thanks All everyone. Right, take care.